good morning. So somebody said there's two different sets of readings up there. Luke is up there. It's the same. Uh, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Good morning. I was actually, I was arranging a funeral Friday, two funerals. I did one funeral, I was arranging another. And so it was all kind of cattywampus. And so, and nobody's in the office on Friday. So, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Doing well. Doing well.
read the announcements in front of me. Short as possible. That's all. What do you think? Yep. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. All right. Does that song make sense to you? Yeah. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship here at First United Methodist Church in Kiwani. We welcome all the visitors we have joining us today and all our regular attenders as well as those watching us on cable television and those who will join us later on YouTube. Your announcements can be found in your bulletin. I'd like to go over a couple of them with you. Our special noisy offering today will be for Abilities Plus. And those are in the buckets at the uh, doorways. If you're coming or leaving, uh, leave something in for the noisy offering. The Community Black History Extravaganza will be held today at 2 o'clock at the First Congregational Church. The Bishop Hill Methodist Church is having a ham dinner on Wednesday, the 27th, from 4 to 7. And on March 24th, the worship team will be hosting a Get to Know Your Church Sunday. It'll begin with worship at 9, followed by a dessert buffet in the fellowship hall uh, following church. Circuit rider deadline will be Friday, February the 19th, no later than noon. Also, you have an insert about the family Sunday fun with the Rivermen from the youth group, and that is Sunday, March the 3rd at 3.05 p.m. at the Peoria Civic Center. I also have an announcement from the Sarah Circle that they will be selling hamburger vegetable soup next Sunday after church in Fellowship Hall. The price will be $4 for a pint, $7 for a quart. Are there any other announcements? If not, I think we're ready for the intro. So glad to have our choir with us. As you take time to greet each other this morning, I want you to talk about the worst snowstorm you've ever driven in. It took us only 40 minutes to get here this morning, so that wasn't too bad. Take a moment, stand and greet the people around you and pass the peace of Christ if you would.
Turn on your hymnal, please, while you're standing to 780. It's kind of like musical chairs when the music stops back in your seats. 780. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city which shall not be moved. God will help it at the dawn of the day. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, God's voice resounds, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. Who makes war cease to the end of the earth, breaks the bow, shatters the spear, and burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Glory be to the Father. opening hymn this morning is the opening hymn from last week, Blessed Be Your Name. You have an insert today, or uh, it can be found in the brown book on page 38. Blessed be your name in, in land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when you're found in
All right. There, we made it through the song. Very good. Pastor Kevin, when he went on vacation, said, uh, well, practice. I want him to sing it two Sundays in a row. And I said, well, I can't follow those little magic dots. You can go ahead and be seated if you want. I'll keep talking. Uh, I can't follow those little magic dots they call notes. So thank you to Teresa who made this up into a nice, uh, easily followable sheet there that I could follow, and uh, we appreciate that. We come to our time of prayer together, and we're going to do sort of what we did last week. I'll do part of a prayer, and uh, then uh, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you please respond, hear our prayer. So we'll pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you have taught us through the centuries to make prayers and supplications, to give thanks. We most humbly pray today that you will receive our prayers. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for peace for our land and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for the peace of the whole world and for the welfare of all of your church and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for all of our bishops from around the world and all of our clergy and all of those gathering in a general conference in the next week, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for our president, for our governor, for all the leaders of our state, for all the leaders of our nation, for all those in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for this city of Kiwani, for the special election coming up, for all of the cities and all the people who live in the area here, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For safety in this weather and for safe travels, for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For those who are sick and suffering, those who are hospitalized, especially Jerry this morning and others we name in our hearts, Lord, in your mercy. For all who have affliction, strife, and need, we pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. For those who come today with guilt and sin, with struggles in your life. We pray for forgiveness, for absolution, and remission from our sins and offenses. We pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died, especially Mary and Carol, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, as we remember Mary and Carol and all those who have gone before us, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole lives to Christ our Lord as to be your people, O Lord. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time that as we pray together that where two or three are gathered, you will hear our prayers. So now we ask that you hear us as we pray, as we sometimes know not the words, but we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
had a beautiful song. What What's the year on that song? Did it say in the music there when it was? 1982. See, now, I think that's a few years ago. That's what, almost 40 years? <laughs> I think that makes it an oldie or something. Or is that 20 years? I don't know, 40, 40 years. Makes it an oldie. There you go. I had a tune going through my head this morning. I was thinking of that tune, We Give Thee But Thine Own. All that we have is a gift alone, O Lord, from Thee. I think the words go something like that. There's more words to that. And I was thinking, you know, I'd find that in our hymn book. We could sing it. It's not in our hymn book. What do you think of that? It's in the Presbyterian hymn book. It's in the Baptist hymn book. It's in other hymn books, not in ours. But we're not going to sing it. What we're going to do is is we're going to stand up and say, Thank you, Lord, for your gifts. And we're going to stand so you can get, reach into your pocket and get your wallet out. Okay, there you go. Just ushers, come on up. We'll take our offering. How's that? <laughs>
Good morning. Can you hear me? Today we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. It'll be on page 958 in your pew Bible. Now when Jesus saw the crowd, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples come to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom in heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. <clears throat> Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they will, will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those <clears throat> who are pers persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. <clears throat> Rejoice and be glad, because great is your own reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown, thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good job, sir. Thank you. Pastor Kevin is on vacation, and when he went on vacation, he said, here's what I suggest you preach on, and it was Luke chapter 6, and so he very dutifully sent out the people who were reading Luke chapter 6, and he got Luke chapter 6, and if you go to the commentary on Luke chapter 6, it says, see Matthew chapter 5. Now, some of you may remember me telling you in previous times that when I was in school, I was a average student. I also liked to sleep in, and I took New Testament Greek. And I can tell you which gospel is the longest. It's Matthew. Because I showed up last, of the four people signed up for the class, the first person who showed up, of course, chose uh, Mark, the second one chose uh, Luke, the third one chose John, and I got there last, and I got Matthew because it was the longest. So I did my work in Matthew, I like Matthew, and uh, evidently the commentaries say, well, look at Matthew anyway, so there you go. Let's look at what Haley's Bible commentary says about the Beatitudes. In these verses, Jesus reveals a model for how Christians are to live their lives and in doing so, receive spiritual prosperity, filling their lives with joy, satisfaction, in God's favor and salvation. This is all despite how the world interprets a Christian's outward conditions. Because of this worldly view, the Beatitudes are often misunderstood to suggest Christ is advocating for Christians that they should live unfortunate and depressed situations, and if so, they are to be blessed in heaven. On the contrary, Jesus goes on to say in the following verses, Christians are to be the salt of the earth, directs them to be light that shines before all people. In other words, Jesus is teaching that if we live as servants with humble and right hearts, we'll be richly blessed here on earth as well as in heaven. Jesus wants to bless Christians so unbelievers are drawn to them. Consequently, unbelievers can be led to salvation in Christ. Jesus talks about this in the words you read just a few moments ago. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on a stand so it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So here's my main question for you today. How are you, how am I, letting our light shine for others? Are we helping people through difficult times? There are people living right here today in this town who do not know Jesus' promise of an eternal home for us. So let's look at Jesus' promise of life beyond death. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And you know the place where I am going. And we skip down to verse 18. It says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me any longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And in verse 21, he sums it up saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. So our first way of letting our light shine would be telling people a message of faith in their time of need. What would be a second way of letting our light shine? Let me read to you a story a friend sent to me this week. It's by a Christian teacher named John Ortberg. You might have heard of him. He wrote a title uh, uh, as a prelude to a book called Parable of the Keeper of the Stream in his book Soul Keeping. It goes like this. There was once a town high in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were old as the earth and deep as the sea. The water was clear as crystal. The children laughed and played beside it. The, the swans and geese swam in it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served as keeper of the springs. He'd been hired so long ago, no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing the branches, the fallen leaves, the debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway, and they had to repair roads and taxes to collect and services to offer, and giving money to the unseen stream cleaner was a luxury they thought they could no longer afford. So they no longer paid the man, and he left his post. High in the mountains, the springs went untended. Twigs and branches, uh, and worse, muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed, Farm ways turned parts of the stream into stagnant bogs. For a time, no one in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water no longer had the crisp scent that drew children to play in it. Some people in the town began to grow ill. All noticed the loss of the sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the streams that fed the town. The life of the village depended on the stream. The life of the stream depended on the keeper. The city council reconvened. The money was found and the old man was rehired. Yet after a time, the springs were cleaned, the stream was pure. Children played again on its banks. Illness was replaced by health and the swans came home and the village came back to life. The life of the village depended on the health of the stream. Ortberg ends his story by saying this, The stream is, its, is the soul, and you are its keeper. And while that may be true, I would submit to you that very often we need a little help in keeping the stream clean. So I would say the second way for us to let our light shine is to reach out to those who might simply need a word of encouragement. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says it this way, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just in fact, as you are doing. Do you remember what I asked you at the beginning? Does your faith ever grow dim? 
Does the light of God ever seem dim to you? Do you ever feel like you really need to find God's direction? Has fear ever beset you? Have you ever had times in your life when you've been scared? Perhaps one of my scariest times was on the Great Lakes. I was about 13 or 14 years old. My dad came home and announced that uh, he had retired. Basically, he'd quit his job. And uh, he was 58, and the company was reorganizing, and they didn't need him, and he said he didn't need them, and he could do something better. And So his friends got together and said, we're going to have a retirement party for you. Fine. They said, we're going to rent a boat, and we're going to go out on Lake Michigan and fish. Now, I know there's some of you here that are great fishermen. And uh, is it true that the walleye are come out at night? Anybody know? Is that true? That's what my dad's friend said anyway, that on Lake Michigan, the walleye would come out at night. And so you needed to go out. And so right about sunset, we all got in this boat. It was a boat big enough for two card tables in the cabin. That's important later in the story. <clears throat> and uh, for me to fish up on the back. And uh, my dad and his friends had their cigars, and we left. The problem is, I had just read a book about the Great Lakes and how, stream, how storms were intensified on the Great Lakes because of a thing called the bathtub effect and a thing called the sage. That's the word, the sage. And the sage is the effect where water sloshes from one side of the lake to the other. And in 19... 54, one sage came across and wiped out an entire pier at a height of waves of 15 to 20 feet, and the water uh, edge level rose 150 feet inland, came in 150 feet. And then I read further in this book that 200 ships had sunk on the Great Lakes in the last 150 years, and Dad said, we're going out fishing at night on Lake Michigan. And we went out and we fished for hours, at least I did. Dad and his friends had cigars and played cards and the lake seemed relatively calm and it was kind of cloudy. Actually, it was kind of foggy. And they didn't drop the anchor because the anchor wouldn't reach anything. We were in water that was deeper than we could ever drop an anchor in that little, relative little boat. By the time 2 o'clock in the morning rolled around and they'd run out of cards, I guess, or whatever, and some had to go to work and they decided to go in. Now, this was long before cell phones and we did have a compass. And we knew that Calumet Harbor was to the west, at least we thought it was. And so we went and we followed along slowly, every once in a while turning the engine off to see if we could hear waves breaking against the shore because the fog was so thick we couldn't see anything. And finally we heard it, the fog signal from the harbor. We crept closer to the sound a little at a time. Finally we could see the faint blip of the light of the lighthouse from the harbor. We crept closer to the sound closer and closer. And finally, on one side the red and on the other side the green, we could see the marker lights of the harbor. And seeing the lights that night made me remember the song that Tennessee Ernie Ford used to sing when they had gospel songs on Sunday night on the television and Tennessee Ernie Ernie Ford would sing, Let the lower lights be burning, brightly beams our Father's mercy across the waves. And I understood that song better than ever that night when I saw that lighthouse. That song was written by Philip Bliss. Philip Bliss also wrote hymns that are in our hymnal, Hallelujah, What a Savior, Wonderful Words of Life, and It Is Well With My Soul. He wrote the music to It Is Well With My Soul. Philip Bliss would travel with the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody 
And Moody would always conclude many of his messages with an account about a violent storm on Lake Erie. And it went like this. On a dark and stormy night when waves rolled like mountains and not a star was to be seen, a boat rocking and plunging near the Cleveland Harbor. Are you sure this is Cleveland, asked the captain, seeing only the light from the lighthouse. Quite sure, replied the pilot. Where are the lower lights? Gone out, sir, said the pilot. Can you make the harbor? We must, sir, or we will perish. With a strong hand and a brave heart, the old pilot turned the wheel. But alas, in the darkness he missed the channel. And with a crash upon the rocks, the boat was slivered, and many a life met a watery grave. Moody would conclude and say, Brothers and sisters, the Master will take care of the great lighthouse, but let us keep the lower lights burning. What are the lower lights? They are our lights that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Our expressions of faith, our lamps lit by the Word of God, by worship here, by teaching, by learning in classes, by reading our Bible, and by prayer. Our lights stay burning as an example to others. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore, but to us He gives the keeping of the lights upon the shore. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave, for He gives to us the keeping of the lights along the shore. Dark the night of sin is settled, loud the angry billows roar, eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave, eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. Trim your feeble lamp, some poor sailor tempest tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let those lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave, trying now to make the harbor. Some poor sailor may be lost. Two great New Testament texts come to mind. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your lights shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. From Philippians 2, verse 15 Prove yourselves blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights of the world. We are entrusted with responsibilities as well. Like the lighthouse keeper, people are dependent on us to complete our jobs. People are dependent on us to be witnesses for Christ. How do we keep our light shining? Are we showing responsibility by sharing Christ in this dark world? By showing a way of safety for people drowning in fear and misery? I told the children a few weeks ago about the little cutout of the triangle, the square, and the circle. And I didn't tell them all of that because there's a lot more to the story, but I want to tell you a little more. My friend, Jim Bruno, who received that, it was a little piece of a leather belt, the original cutout. It was given to him on a troop ship by an army chaplain, and they were scared because they were going to war in World War II. And Jim carried that little cutout all through the war, and when he came home, he had it with him. And the chaplain told him of God's love. And when Jim came home, he lived his life as a light of God's love for others. Jim came back to New York City and he got work as a uh, track maintainer for the New York subway system. And Jim, one day, noticed what no one wanted to see in the subway, smoke and fire. Being a track maintainer, he had the keys and he went to the, the switch box and pulled the switch and turned the power off to the third rail, if you know anything about it. There's two ground rails and then a hot rail, and that's what makes the subways work. And it's hundreds of volts and thousands of amps, and, and uh, it would have killed the people if they'd stepped on it. So Jim turned off the power to the train, and uh, the fire was burning. The smoke was thick and black, and Jim took his railroadman's lantern, and he dipped his handkerchief in a bucket of water and wrapped it around his face. 
and made his way with his lantern to the train through the thick smoke and carried out some and drug others and led others and brought 78 people to safety and saved their lives. But it was not without a price. Jim scorched his lungs in that fire and later in life he developed emphysema. And Jim got to the point that he could hardly breathe and I walked into my little church one day on the east side of the state over in Oakland, Illinois and I heard a sound. It, it sounded like a cat had gotten trapped somewhere like in the workings of the organ or something. A big screeching noise. But it wasn't. It was Jim Bruno learning to play the saxophone. <laughs> His doctor said he could take breathing treatments at the VA. He'd have to go three times a week and it would cost him fifty dollars each time he went. I don't know if it was the copy or all that kind of stuff, but anyhow, it cost a lot of money driving back and forth. And his doctor said, or you could play a musical instrument. Jim started out, he got this saxophone, he had it in his bedroom in the house, in a bedroom in the house. His wife wouldn't have it in theirs, and he played it, and his wife said, I can still hear you. And long and short of it is, the story's a lot longer, but eventually he ended up four blocks away at the church. And his wife said if the windows were open, she could still hear him. We live next door. But uh, Jim would practice, and Jim got better and better and better. Finally got the point that every Sunday, we didn't have a choir for the tiny church. We had special music. And special music was Jim playing his saxophone. And our crowds got bigger in church, and... I'd like to think it was because of great preaching, but it wasn't. It was because Jim said every week he'd contact me, I'll play one God song, then I'll play something that people want to hear. <laughs> and he'd play one old big band song, and he'd let people pick out what they wanted to hear, and Jim would play it. And then Jim said one day, much as we do here, we visit, visited shut-ins, and Jim said, could I go with you and visit shut-ins? And Jim said, I'll bring a suitcase full of music. And he did, literally, a whole suitcase full of music in one hand and his saxophone in the other. And we'd go into a nursing home, and Jim would open up his suitcase and just start playing songs. And he said to the people, all right, when you know what it is, raise your hand or nod your head. And they would. And one day as we were leaving a nursing home, Jim turned to me and he said, you know, we're doing the work of Jesus. We're raising the dead. I looked at him. He said, you know, we walk in there, those people are slumped over in their chairs, barely alive, and when they hear that music, they come to life. We're doing the work of Jesus. We're raising the dead. Yes, truly, Jim let his light shine. A few months before Jim died, Jim called me on the phone, and I reminded him of what wonderful work he had done for so many years. Jim said, I'm just returning the favor for what God has done for me. Let our lower lights be burning. Let's sing together. Our final hymn is an insert in your bulletin, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Please rise if you're able and join us in singing.
the night of sin has settled while the angry billows roll eager eyes are watching longing for the lights of all the shore let the lower lights be burning May the blessing of God our Father, the love of Jesus Christ, the light, the strength, the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us from this place that we may be a light to others. Go in peace in Jesus' name. Amen.